Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me at TOA. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Quick about me, um, I began my career in digital media. I moved to the blockchain space about two and a half years ago. Uh, I created something called Ethereal, which is one of the largest and most um, attended blockchain conferences. I also run something called Consensus Catalyst, which is a blockchain marketing agency that works with both consensus projects and external projects. And the whole time, what's motivated me is a fascination with the intersection of human behavior and transformative technologies. So basically, the way that the technologies we build change what it means to be human and change the way we organize ourselves. So how many of you know consensus? Good, a good number. OK, so consensus is one of the leading global blockchain specialist firms. Um, we build tools, dApps, and custom software. If you've ever tried to build something on Ethereum, you've probably interacted with a consensus product. Truffle is the most widely used Ethereum development framework. Um, about 97, 98% of all projects on Ethereum are built on Truffle. We also have Infura, which is our scalable blockchain infrastructure uh, that handles about 5.6 billion requests per day. Um, uh, MetaMask, our uh, Ethereum Chrome plugin that allows you to browse the web 3.0 using today's browsers that has over a million downloads. Uh, we also have a great team here, Gnosis, which is our uh, prediction market platform. Right now we're also 850 people in 28 countries, so we're growing pretty quickly. Um, how many of you have heard of Ethereum? Cool. Um, so Ethereum is the leading blockchain platform by many metrics. One of the most important metrics is the size of its developer community, which is 30x the size of the next largest developer community around a blockchain, which is Hyperledger. Um, we have the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. That consensus started along with companies like Microsoft, Intel, JP Morgan, Santander, Credit Suisse, Deloitte, which is now the largest blockchain industry working group on Earth. Um, for the purpose of this talk, because a lot of you already know about um, consensus and a lot of you already know about Ethereum, instead of trying to market anything particular, um, I want to go on kind of a crazy thought experiment with you, uh, something I've been thinking about a lot. And for that purpose, it's good for us to uh, discuss here um, Ethereum in the context of being an incentive alignment engine. So one of the cool things about a blockchain system, and this is cool about Bitcoin too, is that it's programmed in such a way where individuals or miners um, are incentivized to secure the network. And securing the network is the same thing as mining by solving these really different transactions, these different, um, these different really di difficult equations, you are remunerated with something uh, with a kind of currency, like Bitcoin. So you're basically tying together, game theoretically, the individual incentive with the incentive of the whole. What the innovation moving from Bitcoin to Ethereum is, not only is Ethereum a similar incentive system where individual miners get incentivized to protect the interests of the whole system, but it's also the substrate for building and programming indefinite systems with indefinite different types of incentivization protocols going on in them. And that's going to be important. So this is what I called the talk. Um, basically, what I, what I want to talk about is if humans and technologies have always evolved each other, what does it mean at this point in history that humans have evolved blockchain technology? And then how is that going to change us and how is that already being reflected in our changing organizational structures? Here are some terms I really like that have come up over and over again as I've been thinking about and researching this topic. Obviously, decentralization. Um, decentralization is a core notion to blockchain. It's the idea that the trust that enables human transactions to happen doesn't have to come from a single source, but it can actually be distributed over a network. Um, we're moving away from single point of failure systems to decentralized systems. An example of that is, let's say, um, the Equifax servers. That is a centralized, let's imagine that on a centralized server, um, it probably has perimeter security. The most um, commonly used example of perimeter security is a firewall. And if you're able to hack past a firewall, then you get a huge honeypot of data in the middle. 
Whereas, if you're decentralizing your information over a network of nodes, you would have to hack a huge amount of them in order to manipulate the system. So by moving from centralization to decentralization, the barrier, uh, the barrier of entry to hacking increases pretty dramatically, and it's like uh, robbing a house versus having to rob a village. Another term, um, deep ecology. Um, I know uh, in Germany, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of interest in the environment, which is great. Uh, this isn't just a term in environmental science. Uh, it refers to systems thinking. So if, if we think about what shallow ecology is applied to a bike, um, you're thinking about what are the materials that the bike is made of? Uh, how do the parts of the bike interact with each other? If you're thinking about, about a bike in a deep ecological sense, you're thinking, um, why does this bike have two pedals? The thing using it must be bipedal. What are the Newtonian gravitational and physical <clears throat> elements at work to make this actually move? What does the consistency of the road need to look like? So basically, it's about systems always being interrelated and co-creating each other. And I'm going to be inviting you to think about blockchain with a deep ecology mindset. The last one is emergence theory. Emergence theory in physics is where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, a great example is like with an organism, uh, like a cell or a cell. Um, if you actually take the building blocks, the atoms that go into an amoeba or a cell and you reassemble them, you're not necessarily going to have something that's alive. The thing that's alive came out of these networks intersecting rather than just assembling these exact building blocks. In an emergent system, new structures arise spontaneously, and then feedback loops determine whether they stick around. Uh, so this is a book that's inspired a lot of my research on this topic. Um, it's by an Israeli historian and a professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And what's really exciting to me is that he brings an interdisciplinary approach that weaves technology into language and mythology and economics. Um, and I'm going to make an argument that um, if I, can, if I can use this clicker, there we go. Um, that blockchain is a technology that is similar to, that could be similar in magnitude to something like the evolution of language and how it causes us to reorganize ourselves as a species and how it moves through us. So this is a bit of a simplification. This is very linear, um, but, but very generally, fire can be said to have caused us to have to spend less energy on our digestive system to have bigger brains. Um, then having bigger brains allowed us to be able to create more complex linguistic systems, uh, leading to what we call the cognitive revolution uh, and the birth of mythologies. Um, if you think about language as the platform, mythologies are the applications on top of that platform that actually let us collaborate in groups of increasing size. Uh, this is a really interesting quote from Mark Pesha, who created VRML, Virtual Reality Modeling Language. Our linguistic abilities aren't innate. They're not coded into our DNA. Language is more like E. coli, the bacteria in our gut, symbiotically helping us digest our food. Language helps us digest phenomena, allowing us to ruminate on the nature of the world. The internet made communications fluid, but this is basically the next step the substrate to create the incentive alignment engines to align ourselves toward common purposes at the species level. So where we, what we've spoken about so far, we've covered the fact that our technologies have co-evolved with us, that they've enabled us to build larger and more complex systems while we enable them to do the same. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about how blockchain is emerging as a very organic looking system to evolve us. Um, so Tyler Volk is a professor of environmental studies and biology at NYU. Um, in this book, he makes an argument that there's a defined set of shapes and patterns in nature that collide to produce new, new things. Oh, there we go. Um, and this is a map of a human cell. In human cells, glucose works as an incentive mechanism to power the interactions in a body. Um, and energy is transferred around to where it needs to go in order to make something alive. Um, Tyler Volk might say it's not an accident that these look kind of similar. Um, this is a map of a different kind of cell generated by Alethia, which is our blockchain analytics platform. This map shows all the participants and transactions in the Gnosis token launch. 
But instead of glucose, the energy powering the system is tokens, and the larger incentivization structure isn't preserving biological life, it's capitalism. The so what is we've evolved a system that operates similar to an organic system in many ways, which is good news for blockchain fans, since organic systems tend to be more robust and durable. Um, this system is symbiotic with us as humans, and like other game-changing technologies, it forces us to ask the question, how is it going to evolve us? What kind of impact could it have on the human species? And how can we use our symbiosis with them to achieve something greater? So this is where we're starting. This is where we are now in how we organize ourselves. Um, we have the traditional organization. Um, it's a single point of failure system. It doesn't benefit from the strengths of an organic system. It can't self-generate, and chaos ensues if something happens to the centralized leader node. Uh, it doesn't look at all like an organic system. Probably someone like Tyler Volk would say this is dead. Um, so Fritjof Capra is a really well-known physicist in Berkeley, California. He came up with a lot of the ideas um, of systems theory and emergent systems of life. He, let's look at how, we define, how he defines um, emergent organic organisms and see if we can apply those to new ways to organize ourselves. So here's what, here's what he, oops, spoiler. Um, here's what he defines as an emergent system. Um, the spontaneous emergence of new structures, and this looks a lot like a blockchain as well, um, that it's an open system, that it operates with internal feedback loops that determine which parts of it continue and that it's programmed with both individual and group incentives. And here's what we're kind of trying to do at Consensus. We're trying to organize ourselves like an emergent system. We're trying to organize ourselves in a way that's reflective of what blockchains can enable us to do. Um, it's one of the first, I think, successful attempts at scale to have a decentralized organization. Uh, that means it's non-hierarchical, uh, an attempt to be as flat as possible. Uh, practicing bottom-up decision-making, so decisions can be informed by the people that are actually closest to the situation. We promote as many feedback loops as possible, uh, as well as group autonomy, and trying to program the system with the right incentives to both incentivize the individual and also the whole. So this is a great quote from Fritjof Capra. The double role of living systems as parts and wholes requires an interplay of two opposite tendencies, an integrative tendency to function as part of a larger whole and a self-assertive or self-organizing tendency to preserve individual autonomy. Long story short, my argument is blockchain could cause a huge shift in how we organize ourselves, uh, which is something that each of our game-changing technologies has done taking us from tribal leadership to feudal or orders with kings to a tendency toward more democratic structures, especially in places where there's an open internet. Um, these kinds of government structures have always been necessary in order to preserve shared resources, shared public resources. You hear about tragedy of the common scenarios, and most of these types of governance structures exist in order to prevent that from happening. But what if we could program a game-theoretically sound system for ourselves using blockchain technology so people wouldn't have to make a choice between value and values? I think that could be a big game-changer to the world as we know it. Thank you.